Okay, so uh, I think we will get started. And so um, we'll do some brief introductions to start. Um, my name is Leah McCormick-Smith. I am the Dean of Students at New College. And so that means that I look after uh, co-curricular life um, and outside of the classroom life at New College. Um, that does include things like residence orientation. And so um, it's my office that is providing a lot of those services. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Carrie. Sure, thanks Leah. My name is Carrie Huffman and I'm the Assistant Principal and Registrar here at New College. And the Registrar's Office is the place for students uh, to be able to access for information about all the academic range of questions they might have. Um, so our office uh, has a team of academic advisors and students are welcome and encouraged to meet with those academic advisors for one-on-one -on -one appointments. And then we have also a frontline uh, operation for just sort of general questions, uh, uh, just-in-time kinds of questions, uh, and we're available, uh, the frontline is available right now by phone and by email. So our office, I sort of usually for students and parents say, it's sort of like the guidance counselor's office in high school. Okay, so with that, uh, Todd, could we move to the next slide? Um, and so we are going to go through a number of things in this uh, presentation. So just to give you a brief outline of where we're gonna go, um, we're gonna talk about some of the key concerns for students as they transition to U of T, and a little bit about what it means to succeed academically and personally, and some of the ways that that can be thought about. Um, understanding privacy on campus, and in particular, FIPA, um, and what does this mean academically, and what does this mean to other aspects of university life? And then we'll also talk a little bit about resources on campus, um, key resources both at New College and the University of Toronto more generally, and then how um, students can access those uh, both if they are on campus and also accessing virtually. Todd, can we go to the next slide? Thanks, okay. And so I guess generally to start off with one of the things we wanna talk a little bit about is that even in this unusual world, students are leaving high school and they're moving into university studies. And of course, there's lots of changes happening um, in terms of moving from high school and moving into a university setting. Um, and so what are the big three things that students, when they're starting that journey into university, are uh, thinking about? And of course, one of them is, will I make friends? For most students, they've been in high school for four years with the same group of friends, the same cohort, and generally those students are going off to a range of different higher education institutions after high school starts. So students are going to be in a setting where they've got lots of new people around them and they can get a little bit nervous about how are they going to go about making friends. And uh, Leah's gonna talk about some of the student life offerings that are gonna be happening in the fall with orientation and then the programming throughout the year. And that's certainly one of the primary ways that students are able to connect with other students and start forming those friendships that are gonna last throughout the time that they're at new college. Then of course, the other big piece is, will I do well academically? And that can be a really big change for students coming out of high school and coming into university. Students who have been admitted to U of T are A students. They have probably been straight A students for almost their entire high school career. Um, and coming into the U of T, one of the things that's going to happen is that all of their peers are also A students. So they're coming into um, an atmosphere that's fantastic because they have a set of peers that they're going to be in the class with, but the expectations at, at the university level are very different than they are in high school. Um, really what's happening when you come into university um, is that they're going to be taking the lead on their academic pursuits, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And then, of course, the other piece, and this might be something you guys are thinking about as parents as well, is will I be successful after I graduate? And of course, one of the things that's top of mind for students is what are they going to do when they graduate from their undergraduate degree? 
Are they going to move on to grad school? Are they going to move on to their chosen career? Are they going to explore different kinds of careers? So those are really sort of the three things that students really think about when they start um, their university uh, career here at U of T. Okay, nope, back one more, Todd. Next one. Yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned, the academic setting at U of T is different from high school. And so I want to talk a little bit about how that change manifests itself and really how students uh, can, can be successful in a university setting. So one of the things to think about is that in high school, you, students are in a classroom with a teacher and the teacher's job is really to ensure that the students in the class are getting the information, getting the curriculum, understanding that curriculum and mastering it. University structure is a little bit different. Really, the professor in front of the, the uh, lecture hall, um, one of the reasons that students want to come to U of T is that we have uh, world-renowned researchers and teachers here at U of T. And so really one of the things to think about is that those professors are researchers and teachers. So they have uh, different demands and, and different commitments within their, within their structure. And they are there to provide information um, and research opportunities to students. And students really at this point are, have to take control of their own learning. So um, for the most part, they're not going to uh, have anyone call the office to ask whether their paper is going to be submitted on time. Uh, they really have to take the lead. So there's a couple of things that can be really helpful in that transition into university learning. Um, some of them are, are going to be included in the programming for orientation at the start of the year around things like um, making that transition into the classroom. Um, there are other things that students can tap into. We have a full-time learning strategist as part of our staff in the registrar's office, and that person can help around things like study planning, which is a little bit different, preparing for exams, note-taking becomes a very different activity. Uh, so one of the things that's really important is for students to access the resources that are available to them. And Leah and I are going to cover off some of those resources that are a little bit different um, at the university level. Uh, but there's a lot of resources available and what we find is that students who are the most successful are the ones that really access those resources and make the most of them. The other piece is there's going to be an adjustment around what does it mean to do well at U of T? So one of the things that I mentioned is all of the students coming into first year are A students. At the end of first year, the average, uh, the number percentage of students who are A students is about 25 to 30%. So this can be a real shift for students who are accustomed to being the top of their class. Um, and so it's really important to help them uh, normalize what success means at U of T. So, you know, one of the things to really think about is, are students sitting at or above the class average? That's really where you want to be able to be situating yourself, because that really means that you're um, in, in sort of the, the top 50% of the class if you're able to be at the, that top average or top uh, above that class average. And that's going to be a little bit of a change, right? But the one thing that we do find um, and that is really important to keep in mind is that as students progress through their university degree, they tend, their marks tend to improve and go up. So first year is a very foundational year. It's sort of a general studies year of preparation to move into programs into the second year of study. And really what we find is that when students get into third and fourth year, that that's really when they're involved with their programs, they're taking the courses they're really passionate about, and that's really when we see those grades really start to shift up. So first year can be a bit of a transition for students, um, but really we wanna make sure that they're 
they're progressing, that they're moving into the programs that they want in the second year. Okay, and so now we'll talk a little bit about what it means to personally succeed. Um, and so one of the things that um, we talk a little bit about with students is the importance of involvement outside of the classroom. And so this is uh, to both help build resume experience, but also build relationships and networking. And I think in particular, as we um, think about in this very unusual time, people um, transitioning into university, Building those relationships and, and sort of peer friendships at university is going to be more important. And so this is one of the reasons we would really encourage students um, to get involved in orientation. Um, New College's orientation is completely free this year, and so students can um, already be registering for that. And to help students um, kind of navigate through this, some of the things that we've done, um, there's not going to be a lot of full day activity pieces. Um, we recognize that students can really only um, be on Zoom for a certain amount of time, um, and that Zoom fatigue is real. Um, and so uh, there will be lots of points for them to come in and do some of the very typical orientation programs, have an opportunity to meet with people like our librarian and folks at the Writing Center and with Carrie and myself. Um, but also with their peers and upper year students. Um, we have a huge group of orientation uh, folks, peer leaders who will be working um, with, with, the, with the students through orientation, but then also through our mentorship program. And so we would really encourage students to take advantage of that opportunity um, because they'll have an opportunity then to be connecting with upper year students who know the ropes a little bit and can help put some of this into context. Um, we also want to make sure that we're encouraging balance during key uh, peak academic periods. Um, and this becomes more important for uh, people who are supporting students to know, particularly if they are going to be um, not on campus, because this might be a place where you really want to pay attention to how it is they're doing. Um, Students, you know, like anyone else, their brain after a certain period of time has really just taken in all of the information that it can and that it's good to take a break. And so even during the exam period, encouraging students to be, um, you know, taking a walk, eating good food regularly, um, chatting with friends, doing some decompression type stuff like watching TV or going to the gym, um, all of those things become really, really important in terms of that um, balance. And particularly once we start talking the term and exams. And then the other piece is encouraging some autonomy. Um, like this is a transition out of high school and um, into being an academic space where people are going to be checking in with them less, this is also going to be a place where student self-advocating becomes really, really important. Um, and so some of this will get covered when we talk about FIPA and we talk about privacy at the university, but the piece that becomes really key to know is that we cannot um, negotiate anything with a student with their parents solely. The student needs to be involved. And so really this is a place where encouraging them to ask questions or seek help um, or if they have a need to come to us and advocate on behalf of that because we'll really try to work with them as much as we can um, but it's important that they start that process of asking for themselves. Um, and with that, Todd, I saw also for people looking at the chat, Todd has put some of the key dates and programs there um, and that we'll have the registration link a little bit later on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie to talk a little bit more about FIPA. Thanks, and just to, just to reiterate, those, those dates and the registration information has been provided to all our new incoming students over presence. So they have that information as well. Um, and just, uh, just uh, wanted uh, to have a bit of an uh, overview of the, what we call FIPA, which is the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which is actually a provincial uh, legislation. Uh, the university had a privacy policy prior to that and it was more, it was in line with the, with the provincial guidelines, but we've adopted these as our guidelines. Um, and so Leah touched on some of the elements of that. But in terms of a university context, what that means is that when a student is admitted and enrolls in the university, they are considered an adult. And so what that means is that the university, in terms of contacting the student, providing information, um, is it only provides information to the student. And the student must provide uh, um, uh, 
uh, permission to contact any or provide information to any third party. Um, so that means siblings or partners or parents or even third party. Uh, sometimes there's scholarship information that has to be provided to a third party. The, the student is required to provide us with consent and a request for that. So in the context of academics, what does that mean? Well, it means that we do not provide any information about academic progress or marks or about financial information to third parties. That information is disclosed only to students. Um, what I will, I think one of the things that Leah and I want to touch on uh, with regards to FIPA is that if, if you were to contact our offices, either the registrar's office or the Office of Residence and Student Life, and would want information about a, about a student, we are not able to provide that information. However, we are able to provide information about resources and appropriate referrals. So I will say that, and, and Leah can speak to this a little bit about the context of FIPA within uh, the resident and student life piece, is that often we will have conversations with parents um, that are about, about um, information that we are able to share. So what are the kinds of things that we can talk about with a parent? Um, and, and I'm very happy to have these kinds of conversations with parents and want to encourage you to contact us um, should you want to have, uh, should you have concerns about um, your student or, or want further information. So we can have conversations about things like what are the kinds of healthcare supports that are available on campus? And we can outline the kinds of supports. Our health and wellness office is continuing to operate going into the fall. Um, there's counseling services that are available online going into the fall. Uh, sometimes we have conversations about things like what's the average course load for a student? When can a student drop a course? Um, what does the exam schedule look like? Um, how can I ensure who's the appropriate person for my student to get in touch with if they're in this kind of a situation? Um, and often what our recommendation is, is that you encourage your student to connect with either the registrar's office or the student life office. So there are, if you, even you can contact our office even knowing that we're not going to be able to give you specific information about a student, but you can contact our office particularly if you're looking for information about supports and referrals. And then so for sort of outside the classroom stuff, a lot of it would be similar. And so particularly if we're thinking about something like residence, we would not be able to provide specific information. Um, in fact, to a certain extent, we can't even confirm whether or not we know that a student lives in our residence. And so that is sort of that protection of privacy piece. Um, however, if somebody calls with a concern, there are lots of things that we can do. So we can walk you through the process that we would normally follow um, if a concern was brought forward. Um, and so if some, it was something like, I haven't heard from uh, my son or daughter in a few days, and I'm just wondering if they're okay, and I've been trying to call, um, which particularly at the beginning of move-in and um, during orientation, we actually hear a fair amount of, because I think students get very wrapped up in what they're doing. and. Um, are not uh, maybe quite as um, on the ball about contacting home. And so what we would typically do in a situation like that is if the student was in our residence, um, we would ask uh, the Dawn or get one of our full-time staff members to go and knock on their door and ask them to call home. Um, and to connect, but we would not be able to confirm whether or not that had happened. And so um, this is where, you know, some of the pieces, we do have a process for all of this, but understanding that there's some, some rules around the privacy piece. Um, if, uh, and if we are supporting somebody, the other thing is we do um, work with all the referrals and, and with folks that we have um, available to us through the university. Um, but again, we would not be able to confirm who it was we were working with with that student, unless that student wanted um, a support included in on that conversation. 
Um, we also couldn't provide information about things like whether or not they had been routinely staying in residence or how they're doing or things like that. But we can provide a bit of outline um, around uh, sort of things that are going that time of year um, and how people can support that. Um, if you do have concerns and you would like to uh, speak to someone though, we are also always happy to have those conversations and to talk a little bit about the kind of referrals and supports available as Carrie said, um, and how we could access those. Um, and with that, I think we'll move to another, uh, the next slide. I know I see some questions um, and we will get to those um, just as soon as we're done the presentation. So keep filling them in because we'll have lots of things to talk about then. So uh, one of the things that we do want to talk a little bit about is the resources that are available uh, both through New College uh, and the university writ large. And so one of the things that we really want to make sure that everyone is aware of is that even though we are in most cases still working remotely, our services are still continuing. And I think that's a really important piece. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the academic resources that are available. Um, like I mentioned, the registrar's office sort of functions as a uh, guidance counselor's office. One of the things that we do really say to students is the registrar's office is your best first stop for information. And so if we can't answer the question, we will uh, know what, where to go to get that question answered. And so we do do a lot of referrals. Through the registrar's office, as I mentioned, we have a frontline service uh, operation and that is primarily responding to email and for um, uh, a phone. And those are sort of quick information, things about deadlines, uh, uh, processes. And then we have a range of academic advisors who meet with students on one-on-one. -on -one. And those are the kinds, of the, the kinds of things that we cover in those appointments are things like um, course selection, planning for programs, so majors and specialists, um, any kind of special exceptions that might be needed for students over the course of the academic year uh, and uh, referrals into other areas. As well under the registrar's office, as I mentioned, we have a full-time learning strategist uh, and the learning strategist meets one-on-one -on -one with students and has a whole range of um, topics that they talk about with students. So things like time management, uh, note-taking, uh, planning for assignments, so sort of doing a long-term plan to space out how you're going to work through assignments, exam prep and study prep. Uh, and they also, you know, one of the very, very uh, um, common things that is a topic is around things like procrastination, how to keep yourself on task when you're working independently on academic things. We also in the registrar's office have a full-time accessibility services advisor. So for students who are registered with accessibility services and under accessibility services, students who have permanent illnesses or permanent disabilities, learning disabilities are registered. They may have some accommodations. Uh, they also do temporary um, registrations. We often find, you know, uh, after reading week in February, someone may come back from um, their snowboarding trip with a broken wrist and they can be registered there on a temporary basis uh, and, and get some technology to help support them. We do also organize a math aid center and a stats aid center. So those are available to students who are in math classes. Uh, they're staffed by doctoral students in those disciplines uh, and serve basically as a drop-in support for math and for stats. Um, and uh, the other, really important piece at, at New College is our writing center. We have an excellent writing center and students when they're working on written assignments, it doesn't have to be essays. We encourage students to take things like lab reports, uh, any written assignment that they have for their classes, um, they can take to the writing center. It's not an editing and polishing place. It's actually we really encourage students to go early on in the assignment and work on, on uh, really uh, working on their thesis, on the arguments in their paper, um, and really taking their papers to a whole other level. So we're, um, the, the Writing Center um, is a great resource for students. I really encourage them 
uh, to reach out there. And likewise, our library um, is excellent. They have moved the resources into an online uh, delivery model. And one of the things that's really popular with the library and new incoming students is actually to um, have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with one of our librarians and to really learn about how to transition into uh, research in a university settings and how to make use of, of all of our resources around research and searching articles and using databases, that kind of thing. So on the registrar's office and the academic side, uh, there's a whole range of uh, opportunities there. And I'll let Leah talk a little bit about the residence and student life side. Uh, yes, so um, we will obviously be providing lots of uh, support for students as they're transitioning in. Um, and we know that this is a bit of uh, an unusual time to be doing this. Um, and so uh, there will be still our mentorship program um, running with uh, upper year peer leaders who are there to support for anybody who is going to be uh, community, commuting or accessing our campus virtually. Um, you'll have the opportunity to connect with uh, our senior peer leaders and they will be doing some office hours and some ability for people to do some drop-in programming with them throughout the week. Um, we, as uh, sort of Todd outlined, there's a very robust um, orientation schedule that we have planned for everybody. And so we do want to sort of have all of those connection pieces available. And um, we also do think have things like an uh, on location health and wellness counselor, they're going to be operating virtually um, for at least the first part of the year, but do have the ability to do um, some support with students on lower tier issues. And then for other mental health issues, um, our health and wellness counselors are continuing to work along with um, my student service uh, or student support plan which is also called my SSP um, which does some virtual stuff as well um, and so there is still lots of support available um, everyone from our office is also going to be um, available for students to connect with on a one-on-one -on -one basis as they have questions um, one of the ways to think about sort of when you would offer um, contact the office of residence and student life we're really kind of the holistic piece um, and so we're looking a lot at how we pull all of the pieces together um, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom to help support students and so if students have questions that are kind of um, outside of all of the particulars around academics, we can be a good place to connect with. Um, we're not necessarily the experts on any particular thing, but we are the experts on navigating resources within the universities. And so um, what we would be there for is to really help kind of navigate with that. The last thing I want to make sure that people um, know, and then we'll kind of move into the questions because I see lots of them there, um, is uh, to continue checking out the student and parent guide um, that is available on the website. And there's lots of information there as well about helping to set up for the incoming year and some things for people to keep in mind and then some more information about our resources. Um, and so uh, with that, we will go to the next slide which is just going to be the Q&A stuff and I'm going to start up at the top. Uh, Jacob um, said in a question about what day does residents open for moving in and is there certain times? Uh, yes, so we are going to be doing move-in on September 5th and 6th. Um, as you can imagine, it's taking a little bit more time to prep for this year because we're really wanting to ensure maximum social distancing for people and, and a safe move-in for everyone. Um, and so you will, everybody will be assigned particular dates and times. If that date and time doesn't work for you, you can let us know. Um, and we can uh, kind of work with you to figure that out. Um, but you will be assigned a particular date and time slot to come in. We're also going to be providing lots of information about the expectations around that move in, um, which will include things like wearing masks in the space, um, where you directly come from for keys and having that residence move in be as contactless as possible um, so that uh, everybody is kind of safe within um, that environment. And so uh, housing will be starting after the end of this week. Um, obviously the 14th is the last day for people to um, complete their sign up for residence, um, at which point we will start uh, doing the room assignments. And so when we start doing room assignments is when we'll start also sending out um, information about what your move-in date is. I would anticipate that that is probably going to be somewhere around 
uh, the week of August 24th is going to be my guess because it's going to take us about a week to get everybody into rooms. Um, if you do have to book a flight ahead of time um, to set up for that, um, what you can do is just uh, let us know and then we can work with that in terms of where we do your date and time slot. And, and Leah, just uh, there was a, actually a question just prior to that um, from, from Ritsu about uh, coming from BC and whether they should apply for OHIP or not. And my understanding is no. Um, if students are coming from other uh, provinces, they would keep their local provincial health care, particularly if they're going back home uh, in the summer. I think that for OHIP eligibility, someone has to live in the province for three months. Um, do you have any further information about that at all? No, but I think you're right. I think it's three months. Yeah. And what well, they would want to do is check the uh, Ontario Health Info uh, Insurance Program website, and then um, that would have more information about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even, even connecting with the Health and Wellness Office here at U of T would likely be the easiest thing because that's where, um, rather than having to try to find a doctor in Toronto, um, being able to connect with the Health and Wellness Office here on campus, uh, all students can make appointments there and can see uh, someone in their clinic ongoing there. Uh, and I have, uh, there's also a question about opting out of dental and medical fees. Um, there are, there are insurance, uh, some of the insurance can be opted out of. I'll find the link for that. It is through uh, the student, um, uh, student union um, health policy or their insurance policy and there's a specific date um, by which uh, students have to opt out of that. So let me just see if I can find that link and I'll put it in the chat. Uh, but it's only, it only pertains to the insurance and the dental component. Yeah. While you're doing that, Carrie, can you also put in the information, the link for um, the fees website? We have a question yes. about how tuition payment is accepted and what is the deadline? Yes. Um, and the so deadline can... is September the 2nd. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'll put in for, I'll, I'll put a link to the, uh, the fees website there. Um, worried about residents move in, Tina. Uh, times and we're from BC and need to book flights. So I would say like go ahead and you can book flights for one of those two days and then if you let us know we can sort of arrange the move-in time um, to be in alignment with that. A uh, question from Benson, if we're able to ship a student stuff to residents ahead of the move-in date, you are not. Unfortunately we don't have enough um, uh, storage space um, to accommodate that and so you would have to ship things to arrive either on the same day or after a student has moved into um, their residence room. Um, and it would be really important to take a look at the uh, information about what is allowed and not allowed um, in residence to make sure that you're not sending anything that they wouldn't actually be able to have in their room. There is very limited access to common spaces right now um, and probably for the first little while will continue to be very limited access to common spaces and so students would want to keep that in mind. Um, what is the latest that uh, Lisa's son can arrive from the U.S. to allow for quarantine? Quarantine will be available um, until December. And so really it would be uh, any period within that. What you would want to make sure is that all of the government documentation necessary is prepared um, in order to cross the border. Uh, and so that would probably be the biggest denominating factor on that. Um, but I can put the link for the um, the website that has the information about the university quarantine piece um, and how you register for that. Um, and there is a supported quarantine through the university. Um, and there's also a space to register that you are quarantining, but if you have um, options to do it offsite and that is your preference, there's information for that as well. Uh, for residence meals, are they still being offered in the dining room or is it all pickup meals? Um, so there are no microwaves allowed in dorm rooms, um, and uh, is there a place in the dorm? So we do have microwaves in the common spaces. However, again, because that's a high-touch surface, we're, we're sort of looking at what is the best way to support any use of things like that. 
residence meals are still being offered through the dining hall and it's moved to an entirely a la carte program. So people will be able to go in and pick the things particularly that they want to eat um, and then take them back to their room. Um, and this will include hot and cold meal options. Um, it will be entirely contactless for students. So things like the salad bar will be uh, staffed by somebody and um, that they will be doing all of the sort of making of salads and things like that for people, um, but people will still have options in terms of what it is they want to do. Um, microwaves are absolutely, and basically no cooking utensils are allowed into the buildings. Um, two of our three buildings are on the older side, and um, one of the reasons is that the uh, energy requirement for things like that actually cannot be sustained um, by the electrical in the rooms. Um, and so students cannot have anything like hot plates, um, um, I saw a question about a Keurig, no Keurigs. Um, you're not allowed to use kettles within your room. All of that stuff has to happen in common spaces and there will be limits on the total number of people who can use common rooms at any point. Um, but you will be able to get things like coffee and tea and drinks and other things from the dining hall. Okay, I'll maybe take the next question because it's yes. about wait lists and course enrollment. And so um, in terms of wait lists, my advice to students is if they're waitlisted for uh, classes, that they stay on those wait lists. The wait lists actually are in place until the end of the first week of classes. And uh, one of the things that we find is during the first week of classes, there's lots of moving around. We kind of call it the shopping period. Um, so what I really recommend is that students stay on the wait list and particularly during that first week, really see what's happening. Uh, while, they're, while, while people are making changes. And then the additional uh, piece is, should you have a secondary course to maybe access uh, as a backup, you should always, always have a backup plan for courses that you're waitlisted for. So if there's other things that you're perhaps interested in, um, I would suggest that you put those in as a placeholder and then see what happens uh, when you've got the waitlist piece. Uh, and then I thought there was another, uh, Derek, you had a question about what, what is the typical percentage of students who make it to second year? Um, overwhelmingly, almost all of them. I would say that there's, there are uh, maybe cases where students, as long as you pass courses, you need four full credits to move into second year. Uh, some students may make decisions to drop some courses and that might bring them below that four credit threshold. In many cases, what students might elect to do is to take um, those additional courses over the summer so that going into the fall, they're uh, registered as second year students and they're sort of on track for what is typically sort of a four year um, uh, time to complete degree. Um, okay, and I've seen there's a couple of questions about mini fridges. Students are allowed to bring mini fridges into their rooms and um, information will be sent out ahead of move in with uh, the cubic feet um, restrictions and kind of the size restrictions. Um, but we actually do encourage students to consider that uh, bringing a mini fridge or we also have the ability, um, students have the ability to rent mini fridges from a preferred vendor um, through uh, an agreement that we have with that preferred vendor. And so we are encouraging students to do that if they think they would like access to that. The fridges in the common rooms will remain closed for at least the beginning part of um, the term. And so uh, if students are going to want to store um, food for themselves, then we would encourage them to, to get a mini fridge for that. Um, uh, so a question from Tina that we're moving from buffet style to per plate. How much would a student on a standard meal plan be expected to spend per meal and how many meals would this cover a week? So it is the, there are two plans available, a light plan and a standard plan. Um, and it is anticipated that that should cover the majority of students for um, each meal. Um, if you do go to the residence website, there is information there and on the application about um, how much people would be, how much is sort of allocated per meal. Um, what is important here is that there's a full a la carte plan, so it's not necessarily per plate, it'll be per item. Um, and so there would be kind of a per day amount that we would anticipate that students would be spending and that it would be kind of up to them to figure out how they were um, going to allocate that, um, recognizing for 
for people, things like breakfast might be actually considerably cheaper um, than uh, things like lunch and dinner. Um, and so uh, that will be, uh, that is all sort of listed in that space. Um, but that should cover a full seven days and sort of multiple meals per day. Um, the other thing to note is if students do get towards the end of their uh, time with us and they realize that they're running out of money, they can add money to their meal plan um, and they can add however much they need. So there won't be um, full set amounts. I think we're looking at probably $50 increments, um, but you wouldn't have to add like a full other meal plan. Um, you can just add how much you need. The difference between the light meal plan and the standard meal plan is just the total amount of money um, that is on the account at the beginning of the year. Um, I got a question from Sylvia Carey, and I think actually this would be better for you. How can students shop if they are not enrolled in courses? How can they attend a course if they are not enrolled in it? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, one of the things particularly right now, uh, given that there are going to be a, a number of courses that are online or remote only, uh, the faculty is looking at ways that students can access the course lectures uh, and the classes while not being enrolled in the courses. And so that's sort of a, a function. A lot of these courses are being offered over um, BB Collaborates, which um, hopefully uh, students have already had a, an ability to access. We've run a number of sessions through that. Um, but uh, right now what's happening is the faculty is working with, um, with this sort of interface the, the, uh, to be able to find a way that students who are waitlisted can actually uh, be able to access the lectures while not being registered. So we're, we're just waiting for clarification, but it is certainly something that the faculty is uh, looking to have in place for the start of classes. Um, I see a question here about taking meals back to the room. Does this mean there's no eating in the dining hall? Um, I would say, unfortunately, I don't really have an answer for that yet. It's really dependent on how restrictions are being lifted um, within the city of Toronto. And then also um, what we need to do in terms of compliance to meet um, any of those uh, restrictions for the space. Um, and so, um, as of right now, uh, for students who are still in residence over the summer, we're not doing any um, meals in the dining hall. That may change as we get closer to September. Um, but there are other common spaces where people would be able to socially distance and um, eat their meals. And some other places that we're looking at is um, having uh, more spaces available out in our quad um, so that people can choose to eat outside on a nice day. Um, and that there might be other places that people wish to do that. Um, so they may be able to eat in the dining hall, but we're, again, still waiting on making sure that we can do that safely for everybody. Um, question from Jacob, is there an app to order meals ahead of time? Um, so there is going to be an app that is from food services. However, at this time, it is not going to be um, for the dining hall. Um, so it will be for some of the other eateries on campus that are run by food services. Students will be able to use their meal plan at other um, retail services run by U of T food services on campus. And so they will have a list of all of the places that are available. Um, but that does include places um, within Robarts Library, um, within the Sydney Smith Building, which has a few eateries in it. Um, that list will be dependent, again, on what is open at the beginning of the term, um, because they will be running a reduced operation based on the total number of people on campus. Um, but students will be able to use their money at some of those other retail locations. Um, and they have said that eventually they will have an order option um, for students within the dining hall, um, but they, th they think that that might be closer to the end of September before it's ready. Um, and we'll obviously send that out to people uh, as quickly as we know. Um, Jenny has asked if students have elected to move in for January 2021, can they move in earlier after travel restriction is lifted? Uh, that would be a possibility. It would be dependent on availability of rooms in that particular time. We are doing some staggered entry, but some staggered planned entry to make sure that we can support people as they're coming in. Uh, and so if the travel restriction uh, has lifted and you're looking to move in early, the best thing to do would be to contact um, housing services to let them know 
know, and then they can work with um, us at the residence to figure out what we have in terms of space. Um, how do students get what they need for their dorm room if they are quarantining for two weeks prior to moving in? So they are actually not quarantining at the space um, in our residence. They, the, the quarantine site is an off-site location at a hotel, which will provide students with everything they need um, in terms of sheets and towels and things like that. Um, in that two-week quarantine period, what they would need to do is either uh, arrange to have order things and have things um, delivered for the day that they're moving into um, residence with us post quarantine um, or at the end of that two week quarantine period they can go and do their shopping at that point um, but for the two weeks that they are in quarantine because it is a hotel service uh, meals are being provided all of their linens and all of that will be provided um, there is a care kit that is being provided and then we're also doing check-ins and programming for students um, so for that two weeks the only thing they should really need is sort of their own personal effects of things they need um, and clothing um, and everything else um, will be part of the service within that uh, how many students are we expecting in residence for September? I think we're probably looking at around the 300 mark. Um, and so to give you a sense of what that is in terms of our normal capacity, our normal capacity with our double rooms is 880 students. And that's typically what we run. Um, this year, we are not doing any double rooms. And so that takes us down to about 740. Uh, but for the initial September move-in, we're looking at probably around the 300 neighborhood. Um, so uh, there will be lots of opportunities for students to socially distance distance and, and to kind of be safe and we're looking at some staggered entries to make sure um, that we can kind of do everything safely for students as they come in. Um, I'm accepted into a first year learning community, uh, but I also read there's learning communities at New College based on their residence. Uh, are they the same? So they are not the same. Um, the uh, living learning communities in residence are particular to residents um, and um, do offer just opportunities for students to connect with other students in similar programs or courses or interest areas um, based on uh, their proximity of living. Um, but the first year learning community is an outside supported program that includes sort of a specific set of programming for students in that in in those extracurriculars. Okay, so we can build that one actually Leah, a little bit if that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, folks, I've been kind of on the sideline listening to the other question that Lisa can answer there. Um, yeah, so first year learning communities, um, as you mentioned, uh, there were two RA life science one, there's, there's, there's a Rotman one, there's a few other ones as well. Um, but the way that they operate is that they're students that are either taking the same set of courses or some of the same courses as you. So it's also a nice way to meet students that are from the college that are taking the same academic courses as you. Um, and as Leah mentioned, yes, they're targeted, um, they're only for first year incoming students to help um, do some skill building academically, but also like social development stuff um, and distinct from residents. Um, so one thing, I, yeah, encourage that. One of my colleagues um, runs one of the flicks at New College and they're a really great program. So as well as, as are the living and learning communities in residence. Um, and one other thing I also wanted to share, Leah, um, flicks, sorry, flicks are first year learning communities. So that's just the acronym, sorry. Good P, unfortunately, there's a lot of acronyms and so I'm typing down. There you go. First year learning communities are flick, not what they're referred to as. Pardon me for using the acronym there. So yeah, I hope that answers that question there for you, Richard. Um, and then, Leah, I'm wondering if it's helpful if I just like, stop sharing my screen for a second and then pull up the um, link for registration and speak to a little bit about the um, peer leader stuff that's going on in the summer for parents to kind of check in. That'd be okay. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop sharing from it. Sorry, folks, that um, the kind of the grid now disappeared again for everyone. Um, so as I kind of just got my link here ready, uh, two points of note. One is for all incoming students that, um, for parents or for the students themselves, you have an upper year peer leader assigned personally to you. Uh, and they have been writing to you uh, bi-weekly for the last eight weeks. Or so, so, sorry, so like, sorry, 10 weeks. So over the last 10 weeks, you'll have five emails you've had received um, every Monday evening they go out, Monday Eastern. Um, time in the evening. So meaning what they are, they're an upper year student that um, are a new college student. They're there to answer any of those quick questions you go and ask, um, have a student perspective or feel on what some kind of things may look like 
Um, obviously things they don't know how to answer, they kind of refer up to people like myself or to Leah or to Terry, um, but they're a great quick response, um, personalized person ready to speak to and connect with you. So if that's a place you haven't looked into yet or you've seen those emails and you're kind of like, uh, I got a million emails, so let's face it, it's like, you know, it's the start of the year, everyone's sending you a ton of emails right now. I would encourage you to look for the My New Roots uh, emails and those um, are sent to your uh, mail that you try to email. Uh, you should have received those on Mondays over the last um, 10 weeks. The second point to, to say about that though is to know that um, those people that you're talking to or will be talking to if you haven't already online, they're the same people who are gonna be your orientation leaders if you choose to register for our programs, which we'd highly encourage you to do. Um, these are meant to be that, you know, we're talking with Leah and Carrie about like one-step shops for resources and how to get support, but these are also the one-step shops for like getting engaged in the college community. And so um, what I'll do here after I stop talking is pull up the link for registration for that. Typically, registration for orientation is um, that there's a fee base to it. Um, meals are included, you know, um, bookings of spaces, that sort of thing. But due to it being virtual this year, we have committed to being free. So there's no harm in registering and just seeing what happens. And maybe you kind of go for day one or day two and you kind of give it a shot and um, see so you have a chance to connect uh, that way. Last thing I'll say, and I see two more questions in the chat, I'll let Leah and Carrie answer those, is um, noting that there are two different types of orientation programs. Students who identify as an international student, so maybe you've, um, you have a Canadian passport, you lived overseas for a long period of time, or um, you've been living in Canada, but you are actually like not from Canada. Um, you wanna take part in a welcome that's designed for the international student transition. That begins, as I mentioned earlier, on August 17th. So next Monday we start, and that's called the New Journeys Program. On the flip side, after that, starting on August the 31st, we have what's called the New Roots program. New Roots is again, so New Journeys is making your journey to new college. New Roots is planting yourself in the community and taking root, right? So that's kind of the idea behind those names. Uh, new Roots is a program that again, the same students that are meeting you in the summer, are they're gonna be those student leaders you'll have a chance to meet with, connect with, have some good times with, but also do some developmental learning experiences as you prepare for your first year classes. So lots of information there, I'm understanding, but I'm gonna provide the link for registration for that, and then maybe I'll throw it back to Leah and Carrie for um, the other questions that have been answered. Yeah, there's a couple of questions there that, that I can answer. So Lucky Ann had a question about life science credits uh, and whether they count towards breadth requirements, and yes, absolutely they do. So any course that has a breadth designation, so maybe just to step back a little bit, um, for the degree requirement, students have one requirement that is to cover off breadth requirements. And there are five different requirements and they sort of range from the humanities through to life science, social science and math and physical science. Uh, and most students cover off the bulk of those with their program requirements. So uh, Lock Yan says he, that they're taking physics, chem, bio and math. Those will cover off both the life science and the math and physical science breadth requirements. Uh, and then what you'll need to do is to take courses that would cover off things like creative and cultural representations um, and society and its institutions, um, thought, belief and behavior, those kinds of things. And one of the things students often do in first year is they, they enroll in some of the first year foundation courses or the first year seminar courses which are small seminar classes. They're usually capped at about 24 students. And often it's a place where you can cover off, students can cover off one of those breadth requirements that is not gonna get covered off in the remainder of their program. So that's one option there. Um, and, uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that students have their entire academic career to cover off all their breadth requirements. So lots of students sort of come into first year and feel that they have to fulfill all of those breadth requirements. That's not the case. It's a good idea to get started on them in first year, uh, but they're not required in first year. Really in first year, you wanna make sure that students are taking sort of the general first year courses that are gonna direct them to the programs that they're really interested in enrolling in into second year. Um, and just wanted to go back, there was a question about um, uh, a student whose advisor has not been in touch with them. We actually don't contact students individually by advisors, unlike some universities, particularly in the US, um, each student will have an assigned advisor. Uh, we don't have the resources for that. So if students would like a one-on-one -on -one appointment with an advisor, 
they're encouraged to contact the main registrar's office and we arrange it that way. And we also want flexibility so that students can uh, get in and see someone in, a, in terms of a timely manner uh, that works with their schedule um, and also some flexibility around being able to see advisors that maybe are matched to um, sort of specific uh, areas of interest that they have. So if someone wants an appointment with an advisor, um, get in touch with our office and we will um, make arrangements for uh, them to have an appointment. Okay, and so sure with, we, Go I ahead, Leah. We, yeah, I was gonna say, I think we got them all. Um, and so just looking at the time, we are at the end of our session time. Um, but once again, if you want to, uh, if you have other questions, you can feel free to contact us uh, via email. Um, would also encourage everybody to register for orientation and, um, and to have an opportunity to connect with some of those peer leaders there. Um, uh, Leah, would it be best to write to Nuda Orsel? Yes. Okay, there you go. For the questions, there's the email address. You can write Great. to um, us there and we'll get back to you. And thanks everyone for taking part and for your excellent questions today. For sure. And lots of, yeah, lots of stuff here. For later. Yeah, and we look forward to welcoming you to campus, both virtually and in person in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Yes, take care, stay tuned, follow us online, we'll be in touch. Um, all the best as we transition our way through August. We're all kind of going through this together. We're going to figure it all out. But as Leah said, yes, looking forward to having you all join our community. Thank you so much. Welcome and uh, all the best.